The filmmaking of Gareth Edwards is probably best known for his masterful command over scale. Edwards has a way of communicating the size of objects and creatures to his audience that emotionally impacts them and makes them feel microscopic. I wanted to dig deeper and dissect specifically why these shots have the impact the way that they do, and why it seems to fall apart when other movies try and communicate that scale ineffectively. Through watching his movies and studying his interviews, I've extracted three key tips that Gareth Edwards uses in every one of his films to make them feel larger than life. A really, a really obvious trick, once you point it out, is like, never show the edges. So in The Creator, Edwards tries his best to never show the edges of the USS Nomad, whether it's cut off by the edge of the frame or obstructed by clouds or a mountain. So you uh -huh. notice conveniently a bit of, a bit of cloud cut off the edges, because then your brain is left to the imagination. You can imagine it way longer. Whenever we did shots and you see the edges, it doesn't look so big. When it is shown in its entirety, it's covered by atmospheric haze to translate to the audience just how far away it is. In Godzilla 2014, Edwards can be seen taking this tip to the extreme, especially in that opening sequence that first reveals Godzilla to the audience. We begin so close up on Godzilla and put the edges of the creature so far off frame that it's almost hard to determine what part of the creature we're even looking at. Is that a neck, a belly, an arm? Even as we zoom out to reveal more and more of the creature, it's only through a tail or some spines or a foot, culminating in the final reveal shot. Even still, the money shot, at the climax of the first act, Edwards holds back showing the full monster in a single frame, instead beginning at its feet and tilting the camera upwards to reveal the monster's face. This revealing Godzilla parallels the same way Spielberg captured the first Brachiosaurus scene in Jurassic Park, a camera tilt from the feet all the way up to the head. By the way, keep this scene in the back of your memory because it'll be relevant again when discussing the next tip. The Mandalorian does a great example of hiding the edges with its Krayt Dragon sequence to open the second season, hiding the entire body of the creature and only having it expose its head and neck at a single time. This sequence, however, is also an example of when this trick of never showing the edges can be stretched a little too far. When I was watching, I thought that the Krayt Dragon was more similar to a giant worm like something out of Dune or Spongebob until I saw the official art of the creature and realized that it had limbs and it was so much more than what we saw. Which was cool to learn, but I would have liked to learn that in the show. Maybe when it summits to the top of the mountain it unearths up to its lower torso or maybe just a single arm becomes exposed. Just a small change I would make to more accurately portray to the audience just how big the creature is below the sand and give them an impression more true to its form. George Lucas even uses this trick in the very first shot we see of Star Wars, with the enormous Star Destroyer ship engulfing the frame to the point that you question if it ever ends. Edwards draws inspiration from this when revealing the Star Destroyer in Rogue One, where instead of the ship being off camera and revealed by entering the frame, in Rogue One, Edwards shrouds his Star Destroyer in shadow and it's revealed as it enters into the sunlight. I feel that this approach is much more volumetric and translates the size and depth of the spaceship much more impactfully to the viewer. Edwards then pulls back even further to reveal the Death Star behind the ship. The Death Star is also never shown in its entirety. Even when the entire space station is on screen, the edges are still covered up with either the atmospherics of the planet or a shadow. Just turn a dial and something gets bigger. But then what you learn is there's a relationship going on and that something's only big when it's relative to something else. And that's the key, is always having the something else. Not only does Rogue One's Star Destroyer reveal perfectly exemplify the first trick, but it also exemplifies this trick as well. Edwards begins the shot of the Star Destroyer by capturing a TIE fighter flying toward it. Fans of Star Wars are already very familiar with the size of a TIE fighter, and the ship starts out at a respectable size on the screen but only shrinks smaller as it approaches the Star Destroyer. Then pulling back to reveal the Death Star, it makes this massive ship we just saw seconds earlier look like a Lego piece. Obviously the scale of things is all relative, so you always try and have something massive and then make it look small and put it in front of it. So you're like, oh my God, this must be so big. You can see Edwards exercise this trick in his other two movies as well. In The Creator, you can see it in the scan of the USS Nomad. The first thing shown to us of the Nomad is the blue scan lines. It dwarfs these soldiers on the beach. But when we move to reveal the Nomad in space, you can see these lines only represent a very small portion of the length of the ship. Which makes us wonder, well, geez, how big is that ship really? In Godzilla, Edwards uses this trick plenty of times flawlessly. Some of my favorite examples are of the small flares against the giant body of Godzilla, the small soldiers on the bridge evading the Muto, 
and the small boat trying to escape the Muto. After establishing the scale of the creature, Edwards cuts to close-ups of both the creature and Ford. As you can see, as we move the camera more toward the actor, the trick begins to break down because the actor begins to take up just as much space on the screen as the giant monster. Yeah, and you've also got to be careful. If you put someone in the foreground and they're too near the camera, they then look bigger than the thing in the background. Let's return to the Brachiosaurus scene from Jurassic Park. Comparing the scene with its counterpart in Fallen Kingdom, it's easy to tell that one leaves a more striking impression with the audience. Film and Stuff has a great video where they go in-depth comparing these two scenes. When the characters share the frame with the dinosaur, they do so evenly, if not giving the humans more presence. When sharing the frame with the dinosaurs, Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler are kept to the bottom half of the frame, relying on exaggerated body language to convey their emotions. The low shot we saw in Fallen Kingdom is even lower here, and again keeps the humans as small as possible. We finally get a full view of the bronchiosaurus in this climactic wide shot. The humans are so small and low in the frame that in the cinemascope aspect ratio they would be cut from the shot. As the dinosaur stands up, it matches the size and shape of these trees, fully communicating the scale of this creature. This dynamic between the size of the objects on screen and how they communicate scale to the audience is where a lot of people are having problems with the new Godzilla Kong trailer. Whether it's Kong running in an empty field or Godzilla and Kong running together in a huge tunnel, there's not really anything that communicates to the audience that these are 400-foot titans. If you just have something big, it means nothing. Like, it's what it's also is in the frame or it's relative to. Um, but I, I used to do visual effects. I spent 10 years doing computer graphics. Before Gareth Edwards was in charge of Godzilla or Rogue One, he spent a decade doing graphic animation work for the BBC and Discovery. After graduating film school and being rejected from Hollywood, he made the decision to switch his focus to computer animation. Jurassic Park had just come out in the cinema and it was clear that this was going to be the future of filmmaking in some way. And so I thought, okay, I'll buy a computer and I got into debt and I thought what I'd do is I, I like, was like, okay, so I'll learn this software and it'll take me about three months and then I'll go make a film. And 10 years later, I was still learning the software. In his time learning the software, Edwards rendered out just a few test animations that caught the attention of some BBC producers. They'd see this stuff and they'd go, what's this? And you'd say, oh, it's just something I did on my home computer. And they'd go, how can you do this on a home computer? And I was like, well, use animation and stuff. And they go, but we pay thousands and thousands to do this in Soho. Like how you can do, and you'd say, say no, it's just normal software. Edwards was able to work from his bedroom doing computer graphic animation work for the BBC. They continued to give Edwards work because their next best option was to pay four to five times that amount to the computer animation studios in Soho. Edwards knew this as well and knew he could use this newfound leverage to try and get a shot at directing. They were kind of trapped and they said, okay, Gareth, when, you know, you're gonna do the show. And I said, no, I don't wanna do it, I wanna direct, but I will do it if you let me direct one of the episodes. And they were like, yeah, we can't do that. But you're going to do the effects, right? And I said, no, because I'll do it if you let me direct one or direct anything. And so eventually they were like, OK, we'll let you direct something on BBC Three that no one's ever going to watch for no money. And then you can do the effects. And I said, OK. His first director's budget was around $90,000. But with his background in VFX, he was able to make it look like it was done with a much bigger budget, which he then turned around and used to argue for an actual bigger budget for his next directing job. Edwards' background in VFX allows him to be extremely efficient in his budget spending. The skill that he learned as a fledgling filmmaker still serves him today as the creator was hailed for its impressive visuals on a mid-size $80 million budget. So having a visual effects background, you can go, that's really, really hard to do in the computer. It's way easier if we just go here and shoot this and then vice versa someone will go oh we've got to go here and do that no no we don't have to do any of that we can stick that in the computer really easy his background in vfx also gives him the confidence in himself to push the boundaries of the technologies instead of sticking with the industry standard for the creator he worked with a uniquely small crew so small that they were able to use guerrilla filmmaking to capture scenes on public beaches and the public didn't bother them because they didn't look like a major hollywood production when edwards approached ilm about shooting it this way they were really nervous because it hadn't yet been proven while edwards was location scouting he captured and cut some test footage in the same manner that he planned to make the movie and without telling the studio he sent the footage to ilm didn't have any tracking markers or dots or any data or any silver balls and all those things you see Just gave it them that all they had was the footage and went can you figure this out they managed to track all that stuff back into the computer and pulled it off and i think they were even surprised and so they were like so we're like can we do the movie like this then and they were like yeah 
It's Edward's background and understanding of CGI that makes him uniquely equipped to get the most out of his visual effects. What I think is the most interesting part of all of this is that even though Gareth Edwards' use of scale has garnered tons of attention among his audience, it's not something he thinks too consciously about when creating movies. Was that when you first began sort of studying the cinematic history of sort of scale and technique in, in um, film? No, I'd say probably began, I, I'm not conscious of it. I see, I know what you mean yeah. in, in a weird way. Like you go, yeah, I guess I do gravitate to that sort of thing a little bit, but it's not like what I obsess over. Also, the three tricks that we discussed in this video are not unique to Gareth Edwards either. If you are ever watching a movie and wonder why the size and scale of something is so visually striking, be on the lookout for these tricks. If you've made it this far in the video, leave a camera emoji in the comments. Subscribe to the channel to catch future videos or watch some of the other videos that I've already made.